welcome back to game three of our second semi-final. Yesterday, we were blessed with all five games. Today, I hope for the same, and we get a battle of two absolute titans of League of Legends. Gen G, that lineage has two world championships and three finals. This would be their fourth. This would tie the T1 record. That is impressive. Guess what? Clid got Lee Sin again, Freak. I think Genji are very happy about that one because they have shown that individual heroics mean so much more than theoretical gameplay in this series. A lot of openings here and a lot of opportunity here. See them and see if they can take it this time. Taking away the Lulu there, uh, and with the Lucian, you expect the Nami. Yeah, kind of interesting that we see same bands as game one and Similar picks. I mean, they did take the Lulu in game one. They just took the misfortune here. But so far, we actually have the fur the same first half of draft as we did in game one, which EDG won. I mean, Lucianami was huge, right? They they got the early Jarvan gank off. That tilted it into their favor. And then from there, it was pushing and pushing. And they basically just two on two killed uh, Ruler over and over again. And hey, if that happens, then that's huge. But the question I'm going to have is, OK, how much better is your warning going to be? How much better is your, is your watchfulness going to be? And I'm also curious what the top lane matchup looks like because EDG had won both sides of the side lanes. Mid lane has been a wash. In the landing phase itself, mid lane has been a wash. It's been what you do on the outside of that phase that's really tilted this game. And you'd expect that the change that'll come with this draft will be the, the top lane blind pick because even bans so far are the same. Here will be the first change with the Orianna taken away this time instead of the Jace. But now, huh, I'm kind of curious, right? Because Rascal hasn't shown that he plays the Jace himself. Are you going to give something like that over to the side of EDG and just counter pick into it? Very curious with what Gen.G you want to go for. Yeah, I, I doubt EDG will, will ban Jace. So so many teams have just foregone going ban against this team and not been punished for it. That makes it cool if it actually does happen. You know, if he's like, ha ha, I've been training all this time. And now, now is where I really shine and pull it out. But yeah, don't, don't think it's going to be accounted for yet. See if they can pull out that surprise though with the blind here. Zoe kind of, I expected you. You're basically going down the BDD specific tier list yeah. with Azir and Syndra both banned out. He has been a game changer with so many bubbles, finding opportunity for this team to get them here. And you know, EDG have left this open pretty much, actually not pretty much, they've left it open every game. So they know that this is a BDD special. They must have an answer into it. And we were talking about the Jace, even EDG themselves not wanting to go that route. Instead, they are gonna be the ones to pick up the Gwen, which Flandre hasn't picked up at Worlds just yet, but was one of his most played in LPL Summer. That's bold too, throwing it down like, hey, you're not gonna pick the Jax into it. Let's see what you got. Renekton, he's got Renekton. Equal odds, it's Renekton right here for the top lane pick. I mean, you can fight back, you can fight back at the top lane, no problem. You, you can brawl, certainly. And if they want to leave him alone and say, yeah, just brawl, we'll play around mid and bot, that fit, you know, that pick fits the play style perfectly. Uh, still waiting to see what he does actually grab here. And it also, wow, it, I, was gonna say. I can't believe it. <laughs> They're wow. going to lock in Renekton. Wow. <laughs> I can tell you're so surprised. And again, it's this theme of comfort on Gen G. And that it has got them this far. You stick to your champions. Yeah, and Chronic, they were saying it on the desk, right? The fact that it keeps working means that Genji don't have to learn. They don't have to adapt. They can keep going back to comfort. And to be fair, I do feel like any generic kind of frontline champion does just fit in their composition. EDG right now do have champions that want, want to jump into our short reigns, like the Jarvan, like the Lucian, which Renekton is fairly good against. Not as, not as a fun of a time up against something like the Victor, but I'm curious to see how Scout will do on this pick. He actually didn't play it this split in the LPL, but I mean, a standard mage for someone who has been around as long as Scout, you know that he can play the champion. Yeah, gonna be trying to farm up early on. On, uh, not fall victim to some of the opportunities there with the Zoe uh, combi combining with Lee Sin. If you get a bubble, that can definitely be dangerous. But Victor, of course, going to be looking for his upgrades as we progress and farming around early. All right, final looks from the coaches. Game three, one of these teams is going to be on match point. I don't know if it's going to be BDD and Co. Clid, who has missed, I believe, one smite all of Worlds. It was to Illusion. It wasn't his best work, but has otherwise been stone cold. Does he lead his team to two straight wins here? Or is it going to be EDG trading back and getting to that second win? Viper was a huge difference maker last time around. He and Mako won the two on two with just a little bit of help, and it snowballed. In this game, I mean, this entire series has been first jungle gank and bot lane has made that lane free. Exactly. I think EDG here should not divert game plan towards the top side. 
they've shown that you know investing a lot up towards Flandre isn't going to return a lot. Meanwhile, bottom side, Viper and Mako put them into the position of power. You know, have the Jarvan path down towards the bottom side again. Even if Genji are expecting it, then you can push them out and you can force the response. Yeah, and I think. For EDG's bot lane, Vettis are sitting on it a lot on the desk about how when you set them behind, EDG looks so lost. I think a big part of that is that Mako is the shot caller for EDG. EDG do release a lot of videos on their social media platforms, and you can see in-game comms, Mako is one of the biggest voices on the team and really dictating the pace of the game. So if he is set behind, especially with Viper, that voice can be lost. Thing is, your boy Flandre is taking the Ignite on top side with Gwen, so he's got the extra damage for the all-in, and that does attract extra jungle attention. So he's definitely going to look the throw down. The E-start on Gwen is very, very difficult for anybody to fight, even with the uh, nerfs to it. So Rascal backs off, not going to take any early damage there, concedes a try. I feel like for EDG, though, it's fine if they want to put some early attention into Flandre. It feels like that's what they've done at least somewhat consistently. But then I feel like after you get Flandre ahead, it's about pivoting down towards the bottom side. Yeah, and they didn't do a whole lot with all the lead Flandre got in the last game. So that is the key. You know, can they actually gain the value of it? Because again, with Ignite, you know, that is putting so much more pressure on the lane. EDG on the bottom side, though. This is where it all happened. All the magic for EDG in game number one was off this success. Yeah, make it go. Ah, actually gets a three hit trade. That's actually pretty well done. So gets the execute off, gets the W to go on two targets and get the autos as they are just fighting desperately for level two. Definitely EDG getting uh, more mini damage early on. A nice little W bounce there as well. But careful, Mako doesn't have a ton of self sustain as he chugs through his first potion. And of course, you know, both junglers starting on top side quadrants I mean they will end up down here. So these trades are incredibly important. Forcing out a summoner spell early on by yourself in the bottom lane gives you that opportunity. Now, there are wards in the river and by Raptor right now for Genji trying to watch for what they're expecting. The driving gank towards bottom, that's what had the big influence in game number one. And so they've got wards up, they're they're looking for it, they get a little ping there. I feel like the scary thing is, right, when all the focus on the bot side, you also have to factor in the mid laners because Genji taking the Zoe, of course, against the victor, BDD is going to have pretty consistent pressure in this mid lane matchup. And that's what I'm afraid of for EDG is the mid jungle duo coming out from Clid and BDD to maintain pressure and consistently hover around bot site. Heck, even scouts and mobile, you can set up picks for BDD to pop off like he's done so many times at Worlds so far. Yeah, he knows this champion like the back of his hand, uses the proto belt to get in front of the gravity field there, going for the excessive trade. Very deep, good deep ward here. I always love when top laners do this, when you have the push, ward the Krug so you can get the inf extra information for your jungler. Process of elimination, they can see bottom scuttle crab spawning there, so JJ comes top with the top one. To get a top lane fight right now. Of course, Flandre's Q on cool. That means Rascal could take the entire trade. Not a problem here as uh, they battle back and forth. The first wave was, I believe, a four CS lead for Flandre as he got the first crash. At the end of this wave, gives you level four for just a moment. And it will mostly go into the turret to fight it. A small CS lead, though, for BDD. He's so far winning the mid lane as well. And Clid probably was known to be on the bottom side based on that, that uh, Krug ward. Ultimately, it's still going to be a trade of Scuttle Crabs. And JJ on his way down now to grab his own Krugs. Looks like the Lee Sin left more camps up. He's actually down a camp right now, so uh, faster farming for EDG. So far in the series, JJ, for the most part, has been down in farm. And so, kind of cool to see him actually up in this game. Yeah, that's very signature for the way JJ and EG plays. That JJ does spend a lot more time at least hovering around his lanes and making sure that they are fine. This time around, not going for any shenanigans. He knows his lanes are a lot more about scaling. Even now, I like that he saved his Krugs for last for a time where Clid potentially could have been looking to make a bot side play. You saw even the way BDD was playing his lane, consistently hovering towards the bottom side, which puts a lot of fear in both Viper and Mako about potential roams that can come. But Clid's been very adaptable, like we saw in the last Last game, this time might punch Flandre. Yeah, Flandre is at least pretty healthy. Here comes the first TP. This is going to be a 3v1. Okay, how many reinforcements do you have? Because it's going to be the follow through. The stun's going to land the queue to follow. They've got everybody here, and first blood comes in. BDD claims 400 gold. And it's all about the setup there. Great punish on the pushing minion wave. You know Flandre is going to want to put it in. He's got this ignite, the, the greedier summoner for top side. No flash. Teleports back in. They instantly kill him. And when you die after teleporting back the lane on a top laner, especially an Ignite top laner, that is yeah. head in hands. Oh no, I have sinned, and it is gonna be pain. 
And I feel like Gwen, especially when she falls behind, can be very awkward and very hard to find opportunities to come in the game in skirmishes or in team fights. You can always find a lot of use coming out from your W. It's a lot of trading in bot lane, Kobe. They're going to trades with Ignite. Yeah, getting pretty low. 100 health on a Viper. Flash follow and life brings death. The Guardian Shield will still tick down with Ignite. Mako trades one back. Yeah, I was about to go over the teleport advantage and possible usage for Rascal here, but it is a bottom lane party. Starting off by themselves, Life goes in, gets the kill. Meanwhile, Bubble's gonna be absorbed by the ranged minion for BDD. But the bot lane is one we thought we were gonna focus on, and it has been a big deal in this matchup. Our feature matchup presented by Mercedes Benz, Viper, and Ruler. I mean, they've been such big parts of both their team's successes, and this year, and for Ruler, the last several, his entire pro career has been on the, the Gen G lineage, and you know, a trade of kills here in the bottom lane. Yeah, and we're gonna go straight into the replay. Really, I see Genji come back, but Viper's still looking for these aggressive traits. He gets the buff up from the Nami, they hit the Q. Bubble does come out, but Life doing so much damage. Viper also took a ton of minion damage for the fact that he did just uh, dash in. I love that Life realizes he can finish this off by flashing in to finish the kill. Mako does get a return. And both kills end up going towards supports, but I think the, the minion wave in a position where uh, Ruler would have been able to catch it on the way back, so I feel like it was a bit advantageous for the side of Gen.G. <laughs> the bloodthirsty support gameplay, both of them flashing in for the kills. But again, all the summoners being blown on bottom side draws all of the extra attention. Junglers start to congregate. You're looking at still teleport advantage for Rascal on top side because of the previous play where BDD invested his over to try and punish Landre. It's about, can Rascal utilize his to get an advantage for Gen.G in comparison to Scout, who, uh, you know, kind of trades it there in the advantage as BDD used his to go for the gank in the first place. It's going to be really interesting to see how EDG want to navigate this one, right? Because it, it really does feel like bot side should be their focus. Scout not going to have really any impact in this game for quite a while. Victor is pretty strong in isolated 1v1 laning phases, but doesn't offer too much burst in terms of any early game skirmishing. So for Gen.G, I still feel like they're they're pretty favored to at least try and recreate the blueprint that they had from last game. It feels like EDG looked at this series as, okay, we know Gen.G of the Solar mid game. They've opted into scaling every game so far, but Gen.G are saying, hey, we don't only need to, to do that. We can just snowball early and look to out skirmish you and end the game before you can do anything. Yeah, Gen.G very happy that it's going so much better this time around with the bottom lane specifically with Ruler not being 0-3 uh, already at this point with all the all-ins and then having the actual answer there. Still is going to be another look at uh, Clid, who just finishes up his red buff and is going to be able to recall now to transition over. Dragon is ready and bottom lane pushing for EDG. Might be their opportunity. Yeah, quick nap, but no quotas to follow through. So, all right, not a big problem. CS going to be in BDD's favor to the tune of about eight. As we have the recalls come through, Scout with the teleport available, easy lost chapter. Might be back in soon. We'll see if there's going to be any top pressure, but Flandre just slowly taking his deficit under Rascal. TV back to the top side. It's eight minutes into that means it's Herald time and EDG are here. That takes a long time to burn down, though, so there's plenty of time for Genji to walk over, and they're going to be looking for the five on five. He jumps in. Will he be an easy target? Looks like no, as it was a blast plant, so you can always ward hop back away. Now it's a full five on five of the lid. Renekton has already shoved the wave into the turret, so a bit of farm actually being lost by Flandre here. 3k health on the Herald. Gonna pop it down to 2,000. Spite fight gonna be in pretty soon. Jinja gonna miss his first engage. Clint finds the kick, and they're gonna find that first kill. Gets the Spite, no problem. 5v4, Gen G came to play. Gen G came to conquer. And that was just so weird coming out for EDG, in my opinion. Jinja jumping in after Flandre gets bubbled, so really no follow up from the side of EDG. Allows for an easy pick for Gen G to turn the rest of the fight. That was disgustingly one-sided right there. As soon as flag and drag forward and BD lands this bubble, what are you doing coming at me in a straight line? Go to sleep, they assassinate him immediately, and Clid is able to shrug it off. Yeah, I've got Smite. Uh, jungler's already been 100 percent so look at this attempt. JJ's trying to hide himself maybe by the uh, by the rip out there, but he, he goes in, EQ, immediate answer from Clid, kicks him over to BDD. They get off the kill, he lands the smite, and Rascal's in position for the flank too. Yep, and in our actual replay, Clint lands everything he needs to do. Gets it, you know, gets the kill, the enemy jungler. All right, now it's low enough to grab the smite, and it's everything Gen.G so far in the last two games.
You get polymorphed, you get kicked. It's that is just rough. Even Rascal on the opposite side of the fight. I mean, Pops Dominus and, and EDG have to worry about this collapse coming from both sides. So no one can follow up the flag and drag from JJ. And overall, just really nice posturing coming out from Gen G. They were in unison with that play. And once again, 2,000 gold lead at the 10 minute mark for Gen G. So hard to initiate. As soon as one of your teammates gets slept like that, knowing you're not going to be able to you know, have any sort of bite behind it. Gen G, though. This Look feels. <laughs> I mean, and, and they know the read, but the problem is the wave is going to go towards EDG. It is going to be farm blood out. Cyber says, yeah, I was sitting in this brush. But he goes, yeah, I'm sitting in this brush. And Jay's just going to wait around, you know? It's like, all right, if you show up, but nope. They don't want to bleed away the farm. And they're going to go ahead and just like slow push the turret. And Gen G make the right choice to sacrifice three melee minions, but not be ganked. Yeah, I, I just am so curious how much EDG are, are putting into this play. Feeling like they're falling behind and need to find something somewhere. Jijit now here for about one minute. Finally starting to channel his recall. Really good respect coming out from the side of Gen G while Clit is just champing through his jungle, farming his camps. Jijit now going to be a bit behind in terms of tempo. Yeah, takes the recall, goes back to the top side. Okay, camps to clear out right there, but wait for the mythic timing. We have yet to see a dragon claimed. The Rift Herald belongs to Ruler, which honestly guarantees you're getting the money on a misfortune. Seems pretty reasonable here. Looks like he may send it towards mid as the recall comes across, and that is the most injured turret right now, down a plate and a half, basically. They spent enough effort, that's the entire turret if they want it. Yeah, he's been walking with a Gale Force, so this is gonna look really good. First Dragon gonna go to Gen G as well. Yeah, and they should be able to chain objectives. They've gained so much. When they have this Zoe pick for BDD, they'll love to go to set up at it early and then throw bubbles. As soon as one lands, you know, the enemy team's trying to dodge this whole time, but all you need is just one of them to hit and give you an opening, and they get rewarded again. This one picked up as well. Top side hovering from JJ isn't going to get a lot quite yet. And not going to find anything following through there. Ooh, Genji. Ooh, he lands the bubble. Possible play. Lands the Q. Do they go for any more? I think if that Q had landed, but now Flandre wants in. Ult and Ignite gets the ulti back. A flash out of Rascal. And you got to auto in between those ult charges. So he has to turn around to the minion wave. And Rascal, last ult charge, will not quite kill, but it forces the ulti out in case there was a dive. Look at this rotation, though, too, on the mini map. Clid coming up. Okay, it gets kicked into the wall. A good dodge wave of Flandre. Careful, the Rascal will show up. The slow is going to be decent. Flandre able to life steal back up. Tidal wave onto a couple. BDD going to go for the play. Has an extra flash and gets right back out. Life knocked into the air, but not taking enough damage to be killed. Mid lane turret down to a single plate. Minions tank the damage. BDD walks out. A kill in the mid lane means Gen G grow the lead. And Gen G just rotating around the map so well, they get Dragon posture towards mid, which gives them pressure. <laughs> Clint can go answer up in top side, which allows their bot lane to follow up on mid. So really nice sequence of events coming out from Gen G. And we saw in the mid fight that EDG really didn't have the damage to match. Scout's damage output nowhere near what BDD does. And even BDD and Ruler both have a mythic advantage on their counterparts on EDG. Yeah, again, it is Gen G looking to leverage more opportunities for themselves, actually prying the hands open. They move bottom lane up to mid, as you say, so make this Rift Herald play mid. The only payment Viper got uh, was one extra wave and I believe one turret plate during that mining and so much more for Genji. So again, they had early chunks on Scout. They're trying to take away, chip away at some of his potion use using the Rift Herald. And JJ is the one to start it out with the Cataclysm into the Chaos Storm, but flashes there for Genji. BDD is able to find that punishment, and they couldn't finish off life either as he was pinned towards the extra, uh, the end of the wall here. Now I feel like this is going to be so hard for the side of EDG that Genji does have this mid lane turret down. BDD was already playing with Fog of War so well, but you can keep up your wards in enemy jungle. You can start pivoting down more towards what I would assume would be bot side and going for those plays that we were hitting on earlier of both Clint and B BDD syncing up to put pressure on Viper and Mako. And they got the dream first objective of mid turret being down. Zoe just has a field day now. Lyric, not only has he gotten three of the kills, so Zoe's going to pack a much bigger uh, punch here, but also so many walls now he can slip over to. You see the kind of bloom of vision around that mid lane. Tower's down. Now the wards are there. And those bubbles, he has just been so accurate with them. And now a, a big thing to look out for, too, is if Genji will look for an opportunity to potentially punish Scout's flash. Because you can see on the minimap, Scout is so afraid of walking up. He's in a mobile mage. You have CC and Burst on the opposite side from the mid jungle 2v2. You have push coming out in bot and top as well as EDG. I mean, just trying to find anything they can. Yeah, the buff came in from Nami a little bit too late. Didn't find the slows. Could have been maybe a bit more in a clip. Maybe could have been 
a follow through as a result, but not going to be much. Just the 4,000 gold difference remains. Dragon's count oh. still only at one. Has to burn the flash, but they might find the rest, and they do. Clint lands the skill shot. Jitter gets a knock up, but he's going to be rooted in place. Thank you, Everfrost. Reinforcements have come, though. BDD going to fall. Tidal Wave not going to get any more targets, but Viper's on the board. That's a bounty to Viper, too. Money in good hands. Remember how many back and forth opportunities were in the previous series. This one now is at least some money back in one of the carries that they need. Yeah, the big problem, though, is as we see on the screen, right, that Ruler's winning out on the opposite side because Viper and Mako need to go try and save Scout in the mid lane. We just hit on Scout's Flash, which now Scout really cannot walk aggressively forward, or Gen G can recreate that play. Clint even still has his Flash to look for any sort of playmaking that needs to happen. So we are going to go straight into the replay. And, I mean, Scout trying to get the wave, just really nice bubble from BDD, even using the terrain from the Broken Tower. Q connects, he goes down. And you see the minimap, both Viper and Mako are on their way forward. Genji still thinking they can go for this, but they buy time for Viper. Tidal wave not even needed. And like you said, Kobe, such a critical shutdown to go in the pockets of EDG's main carry. Yeah, they've got to have hope, EDG. And that's one thing that will spark some of it as far as the comeback potential for them. But. Genji will just continue to leverage their advantage over here on the top side. Uh, they don't rotate BDD uh, over. He's going to bottom side to pick up the extra minion waves because they've got everything wrapped up there. And can he make another individual play? Oh, yes, he hits he it. Drowsy. Can. He's going to get hit down to half HP. Ulti comes back for the trade. Decent damage out of Scout. BDD will not find the second shot. Health bar lead still goes to BDD off the flank, off of the nice Fog of War play, and top lane outer drops as well. Gold lead, pretty nice looking, four and a half thousand, but EDG have overpowered the bottom side, and they are gonna equalize the dragon score. Herald charge is only gonna get damage on the turret. They're teleporting. They're, that's power. It's a late teleport. The dragon's already gone, but they're doing it. Wander's an FTP. BDD not gonna be an easy target just yet. Viper gonna cleanse away. And now looking for that fight on to Rascal. Tidal wave to buy some time. Push ruler out. Rascal still the target, but not gonna go down. And Clid is here for the flank, here for the kick. Is he gonna get the target that he wants? The flash stun, the double knockup from Lulu, and they're going to slaughter everybody. Two for nothing, two for one. They do trade back on a Clid, and EDG forced to run. It doesn't matter that the TB came out late. Genji knowing that they can take this fight. They can just traverse through the enemy jungle to cut off bot side because there is no turret there stopping them. And right now, Genji just feel unbeatable. 5k gold lead at 17 minutes. Genji are completely running away with this. They only go positive one kill on the play. Ah, there it is. The answer teleport comes out, so there's no objective in response. And the uh, no extra gold here for Flandre is going to have to run his way right back down the lane. Not going to get chased down, even though he doesn't have any escape summoner spells. Definitely going to be progressing the game forward. And the uh, the dragon being picked up, maybe that delays you know, some of the progression there towards ult. But here it is trying to really make use of the teleport discrepancy. They've got the extra person down here. So you know they're committing to that play. Flash forward. The target selection good onto Viper getting the stun. Yeah, and you know, EDG do find one back, being able to take down Clid because of how much he does commit to that play. So that's pretty decent for the side of EDG if we're looking at ways for them to come back in. Flandre also finally finishing up his Riftmaker. I've just been sitting on the Leeching Leer for quite a while, but I still don't feel like EDG are in any position to even think about fighting. And the only real way you have of looking for picks is if someone on Gen.G oversteps, like if, if Rascal pushes too far forward down in the bottom lane, because Gen.G are playing so well as a four-man core. We're gonna find another turret. Four to zero in that score line. Barely any neutral objectives have gone EDG's way. The one they got was a dragon, and that turned into an extra death on their side as Gen G collapsed. So, yes, the lead is still growing. It's getting better and better. 6,000 nearly the lead. I was just marveling at how BDD has, has ascended during this tournament. Is absolutely dominated. Just take your pick. Yeah, continue to throw bans at him. He has absorbed bans every single game he has played at Worlds, and yet he still has such a huge impact on all of the games for Gen G. This one, especially on the Zoe, one of his favorites, doing it yet again and leading the charge here. Now, we've seen this so many times before. You're down map control. You don't have turrets to rely on. You're losing out in vision to Gen G, and the fear of the bubble is just so big. It looms over your head. Everybody has to just be perfect in dodging. 
And it even goes to show that BDD has kind of said, you know, I don't care about the meta, right? They've banned away what were the perceived best champions come out of planes and group stage consistently in the LeBlanc, in the Twisted Fate. They don't pick up the rise really ever, but still being able to find a massive impact. And I feel like for Genji across the board, they have really good players. That's why this team consistently finishes second to third in the LCK. We're always looking at for someone to step up with a star studded performance. In this tournament, it has been BDD. Here we go, turret falling rapidly. Right, nice damage out of the Victor, honestly puts Ruler to half clip the same. So they're gonna get to wave clear and live another day. It's all about letting Flandre catch back up, letting him get some more farm, get some levels under his belt. Gwen is a scaling top lane pick, and the fact that Genji's done so much in the early game is obviously gonna look good. If you can get Flandre the rest of the way there, though, that could be maybe a turning point as they wait for that to happen. Uh, a farm lead in bot lane looks kind of nice. They're both at two items down there, a red to be handed over. But Genji, of course, still with complete control. I feel like the thing I'm afraid of for EDG is that EDG aren't really used to being in the position of playing from this far down. This is a problem a lot of teams like EDG, FPX, RNG have because they're so dominant in the LPL. They always have like two to 5k gold leads at the 15 minute mark. It is why typically when these teams lose, they lose very hard and they lose very fast because they haven't had to practice those comeback mechanisms to get yourself back into the game. I really like Genji's read so far of just pivoting to these more early game oriented picks, especially in mid jungle to take the series. Yeah, I was kind of scratching my head at EDG giving up early priority in both solo lanes. You just feel like you lose so many, uh, you know, chances, especially towards the early stages. And Gen.G, Clid, BDD have been very happy to take advantage. A nice attempt there. Dash, Gale Force, get the Nami buff. Nah, sorry, bud. Life's nearby. Pops the Shirelias, out you go. And they're going to be just fine to walk away. And there's no aggressive play yet for Viper. Jeja, obviously, the primary engage. If they're going to have one, a level deficit for Flandrip. You can see Rascal, generally speaking, going to take the bottom side of that trade. And we're not even at two full items just yet. Flandre going very much more for an aggressive option in the Cosmic Drive, not the Zonias, just as much stats as possible. Yeah, just going to go for that, wanting to look for these teamfight opportunities rather than just the solo 1v1s. And now with Dragon coming up, I would expect EDG don't want to opt into those teamfight opportunities just yet. You can see Scout still pushing him top, even though he has DP. This should just be a Gen G Dragon. Yeah, I actually love the Cosmic Drive two item power spike on the Gwen. Affords you so much chase, just being able to spam out your abilities, but uh, BDD heads on over past some of the vision, and look at this, Gen G are taking taking over as the split push from Scout from EDG answers on top side. Okay, but BDD without the jump right now is going to find a Polymorph, going to find a bit of damage. Flounder able to jump away, has decent health, keeps the wave alive. BDD won't find any more poke, but two at half health. Thank you, Ruler's ultimate. Means the turret's going to fall and Gen.G keep pushing forward. A turret trade on the side, though. It is an equal amount of farm gained and lost. Equal number of turrets gained and lost. Scout playing on the side lanes, catching up on the victor. Getting the two items would be a very big deal on such a carry. Yeah, and that's exactly what EDG are waiting for. EDG are just kind of looking to turtle right now, have defensive vision lines, give up what they are okay to give up, stall out the game, which is why we saw Flandre committing down in the bot side for that ultimate. I think they realized the turret was probably still going to go down. They weren't looking to win the fight. It is just buy more time and then hopefully live to fight a day, whether it's at a Baron or at a Dragon Soul in, you know, 10 or so minutes. Yeah, hoping that they can play a mistake-free fight at a later objective. That That is the goal. Try and scale, continue on, getting your, your AP threats, some more money there. They're lagging behind, Freak. Sure. But eventually, they're hoping they can catch up. Well, I remember saying the gold lead was 6,000. It's four and change. The turret score was four to zero. It's now five to three. I'm not saying EDG are fully making the comeback, but they have gotten closer than the worst point in this game, and their picks do scale well. Three full items now on Viper's Resolution. Rapid Fire Cannon is done. That's quite relevant. And keep in mind, for the beginning of this game, it was rough. Mako's lane was so uh, difficult. It was 15 minutes he transformed his Sightstone over. That's when Frostbane came online. It was late. So Vision was rough for a while for this squad. I'm hoping they can hold on in the mid-game. We're still nine full minutes away from Dragon Soul, 32 and change, almost 33. Yeah, that, that's going to be a while, so if EDG can hold on, they will scale up. And for now, right, again, they're still fine doing that. For Gen.G, the other team that has to be more proactive, I think playing around your top side with your Zoe to look for picks, but EDG in response, no. It's only about looking for cross maps. Still Rascal doing a good job of warding up. The point is Genji need to be the ones to keep pushing the tempo, keep looking for picks with the Sleepy Trouble Bubble, because even later on the game, that's going to be the champion they can rely on. Two outrange champions like Victor potentially find a pick and set up for your composition to, to win out. Exactly. I want to say they're going to be very, very aggressive with their vision. They're taking over Blue Quadrant right now, setting up 
up these super deep wards that allow for those bubbles. Yeah, BDD, we've seen him do it in Fog of War, but set him up with some vision too, give him a little help so he can find his targets. And the side lane lead is still half a level. Uh, Rascal versus Flandre, it's about to be 15 apiece, but right now it is a deficit. Gentlemen, the night is dark and full of terrors for EDG here. Great yeah. vision toggle by the observers. When you know that BDD is walking around there through the fog of war, just waiting. Oh, wow. BDD going to be chased down. 100 health left. Viper nearly assassinates. I love that play. The willingness to go forward and look for the big damage. Exactly. Th those are the types of plays you need to look for. When Genji are aggressively looking for these picks, punishing where you can. Viper instantly recognizes the moment to go for that calling. It was extremely close. You don't get anything off of it, but the objective for EDG is, as we've been saying for the past 10 minutes, it's time. That is the objective that EDG are playing for, just continuing to, to buy out. It doesn't even matter that lights pretty much went out in their blue quadrant jungle because they do have wards on Baron, and as long as Genji aren't doing Baron, EDG are completely fine to just chill out. So I'm curious if Genji will look for a more aggressive route of like opting in to bait out a Baron. Yep, then you look at rotating your Scryer's Bloom Trinket cooldowns. Right now, they're both on cooldown from both Scout and Viper, so it requires EDG extra attention walking up through the dangerous openings. All right, well, a drowsy Jarvan, but not going to be the target. 7,000 health from the Baron. TP's coming in. This could be the fight. Level 15 on both top laners, so the half level lead is right now going to be equalized, and we wait for the next big play. Pinging on the way to the top lane. Genji going for an inhibitor turret. Yeah, Genji doing a nice job. Looks like it's gonna be a little bit of a trade that Genji should win off. They don't have much of a wave though. They just let EDG are answering so slow. Yeah, they can face they can face check here. You know, or Gen Genji can just tank the turret with their Renekton, usher up the minions, they get the inhibitor trade, and it's going to be You have to recall soon. You can lose Nexus turrets. They're just trying to get some money. EDG are saying, all right, we can't actually fight you. We're just going to take some money and hope that they can actually farm the top wave. That is the one that is closer to Baron, so it is less of a risk than the one on bottom side. And EDG are just committing to this farm from it late strategy. The test is can you get through the next yeah. few minutes while it respawns? The supers will be feeding you on that side, but Vision is imperative. Rascal gonna try to mark, right? He's the one in the way. 8,000 health from the Baron still going down. Vision is gonna be in the pit, though. The control not far enough up to force it out. Life goes down! Viper refuses to play defensively, and this time he is rewarded. BDD pushed a bit low. Will it be a smite fight? Because EDG are staying in the pit for now. Clid has landed practically every single smite this championship. And be careful, Jarvan. Drop down. 5k health. Baron resetting. Rascal forced back. Scout's on the chase. Down to 1k health. Ruler not going to open up just yet, but Scout is going for more. Going to find the slow. Going to oh. find the assassination. EDG 2 for from a gold deficit have closed it down to half. Bullet time able to close out the wave, but they still get the turret. EDG with signs of life. We're scaling, boys. That's the EDG motto, and Viper is not taking any of it. Absolute masterclass there. Turns it around. What, what an aggressive posture for the position on Baron, annihilates life, gives him the opening lyric. Yeah, and I think on the opposite side is Gen G potentially gonna look to contest. Scout does have teleport though. So you be careful. Fight. This one around, it's gonna be Flounder able to claim it. Clid did not smite, Jinja went a little bit early and Flounder got the last hit. So, Dragon score is tied, but once again, you know Baron is on the table. Scout has TP, no one else on his team does. Also, no cooldowns there for the Scryers for EDG, so. Uh, they've got the existing control wards there, should buy them enough time. Again, the super minions, look at that top lane. They're letting them kill off their own minions to continue to funnel into these scaling AP solo laners that they picked. And again, Ruler dropped to two thirds, gets the shields, able to stay alive. Gale Forces, I believe, traded. Clean control to vision. Ah, and going back to the point code we just made, right? EDG are going to actually kind of be happy that that top lane inhibitor is down because you're not going to put yourself in harm's way to be able to get gold on the map. And I also think we're starting to see that Genji feels very pressured, right? Because we're talking about these aggressive picks that they need to make. So they feel like, hey, we need to bait a Baron because EDG aren't coming out of their base. The problem for Genji is you don't really have turn potential. You don't have like a Leona or a Nautilus to when they walk in to engage uh, on them. So that's why we saw in the first Baron bait, Rascal having to go behind blue buff wall and trying to flank them out. But when they don't have that flank, Genji actually aren't in a position to win out those fights. 
so, so nice to see, too, Viper not flinching, not backing down in some of these very dangerous situations. We mentioned how hard it has been for everybody to dodge out on bubbles, for everybody to be so afraid when you don't have Vision and Gen G have Zoe. But Viper has not backed down. Even with the couple of mistakes in the first game and getting caught, he's still playing so aggressively with this Lucian, wants to punish at every opportunity, using that ultimate to chase down uh, and, and really leverage EDG some more breathing room. Uh, so far, really good job coming out from Viper. He's been like the large playmaker to where it feels like Scout has just been more of the backbone damage being willing to come through. For the side of Gen G, it does feel like it still has mostly just been the BDD and Clid show, even in this series, setting them up for success. Sure. Ruler, I think, definitely having a, a solid game so far, but still not, not seeing that playmaking potential or the pick potential needed to come out. For Gen G, it seems like now they're a bit scared, they're a bit shy. Clid! Huge damage, has a ward that hop away, but you can see Viper always wants in. He's on Infinity Edge 4th, he's leaving the boots at Tier 1, he's just going for the damage and the crit chance, and he's pushing people around. He certainly is. He's pushing them all over Summoner's Rift. Fear the name as soon as he dashes in with that confidence. Such big health leads. And again, EDG leave the top wave alone. It kills off theirs, pushes right in. Someone goes to collect. And they haven't lost a lick of Nexus turret health. It's just been the gold income. Yes, it's going to be harder to push out of the map. Yeah, it's going to be harder to push forward when you are back in your base so often, but it is money going only one way. They're playing the econ Woo! game so Close. well. I feel like for Gen G, you really don't have a lot of great options right now. They're just continuously looking to commit as five. But when you do this, you are only relying on a bubble hitting unless Clid finds some kind of flash, ward hop, kick, you know, Viper into the enemy team. But everyone on the side of EDG has summoners up. For Gen G, I feel like the play might just be answering on the bottom side of the map with Rascal and even committing maybe BDD down there to try to find a pick on a fly. Oh, they're trying. He's going to be sleeping. No, he's going to flash away and stay alive. Cleanses away from the bubble, but Viper's out of summoners. Mako forced to flash at half health now as well. This is going to be a tough fight for EDG now. Yeah, Gen G have to pressure now. They waited so long. EDG have played the Econ game for so long, and now critical flashes on both bottom laners from EDG and the health leads mean that Gen G will take this moment, this opportunity to try and force on the Baron. Teleport is ready. There's Baron. the ward. They spot what's going on. What's this play going to look like? 10,000 on the Baron. Scout wants the poke. Can't find it just yet. Viper is out of summoners. He's got no Gale Force. Oh, BDD's behind. Just his dash to live. BDD not going to land the first bubble. That's going to be a cooldown for a while. Flandre jumps into the pit. He can always E back out, but he keeps the Baron aggroed. There's the jump on out. 6,000 health now. Ruler still waiting to go. Sleep on a Mako. Going to be blocked by Jejin. No Q to land. 5k on the Baron. Is this the play? A jump in. Huge damage. They can try to burn Baron right now. They can could have everything they want. Mako dropped low. Scout wants the burst. Clint pushed around. Is this the play? It's been claimed. That one goes to Gen G. The kick does all right. It's a one for one so far. Flandre going to be attacked. Flandre cannot kill Rascal. BDD at one health, but Scout is in. Scout is here for supremacy. And it's two more kills picked up. The recalls come through for Gen G. It's a gold lead, but the map belongs to EDG. Still two for three, and Gen G are the team that get bare, and I feel like they feel fine for that trade. They finally got something going, but the fact that Scout, the scaling member for ADG, is able to get more gold in his pocket, the longer this game goes, the, the harder it's going to be. Ooh. Is this an attempt at a trap for Rathman to find Scout? Oh, Could CP in. This is big damage. A flash force. Viper cannot chase, but that should mean Dragon comes through. You know there's a spite the enemy team, but you also know that you are cleanly 3v2 here. Yeah, even Scout now going to be able to return to the fight. Has his ultimate available if Gen G decide to opt in. I feel like EDG should be able to get this unless Clid can find something. Mako could get one shot if Clid had his ulti, but it's not up right now. Rascal can come through. Life and Ruler are alive. They're going to be here. So it's a three on three. This is going to be tough for EDG to win. Sticking around, but Life is here. Jeje now as well. Can they force out Clid? He's jumped backwards. Should be smiteable soon, and it will go over. Dragon Soul Point. All five in the river. EDG five minutes away from a win condition. They're going to pop the Sorelias just to try and check for any stragglers, but they're out. And EDG, they pull that fight back despite how much work BDD did in the opening. You know, he uh, uh, annihilated the back line there. He hit so many bubbles. He hit so many bubbles. He took out JJ to 10%. Thought it was going to be just all she wrote after the jungler so heavily chunked out. Chunking out on the support as well. And yet... The carries there for EDG pull back the fight. They still get something. They get the Dragon Soul point for themselves. 
and still can play the Econ game. Here, look at all this damage from BZ. It's actually insane. On the jungler too, a priority target. Then on Mako, they're so low. Flandre goes in, they force on the Baron, though Scout on the outside is coming around and JJ flashes in, he attempts to smite. It is a little bit early, the Misfortune does get it and then goes in for the knockup, but you don't get to see the cleanup because right back here with the Baron, what can Genji get out of it? We're gonna keep our eyes on Misfortune and on Zoe again. Zoe having so many angles she can play with in corridors like this. Not gonna find JJ just yet, but there's gonna be a turret down to the bottom lane. Flandre in for a bunch of damage, drops Rascal well below half. A BDD, BDD, oh. you poked and you got poked back. You were flashed down and jumped to the opposing team. A recall out from Rascal. But that is just a clean pick for EDG. Yeah, mistake coming out from BDD. I mean, he has done so much heavy lifting at this world, so I feel like he's allowed a few mistakes. But in these crucial moments, it's giving EDG life back on the game. Now, not even 2,000 gold down to Genji, when earlier on, Freak, you were hitting on that, it was about 6K. Yep. I do feel like this whole sequence of events started off with an EDG mistake of like the face check from Viper. Genji then played around the mistakes well, but I feel like we're at a point now where the damage coming out from Flandre and Scout is just so massive. The second ult I've seen from Rulita completely wave clear, and it's useful. It definitely buys them time, but EDG have control right now. Yeah, that wave actually syncs up with the timer from BDD. Uh, now with only 10 seconds, he'll be back up. The hope for defending there arrives for Gen G, and now it's still going to be EDG at your gates, trying to mine away all the extra gold here through top side of yep. the map. But you've got everybody back on the map for Gen G. You've bought your time. Just don't face check. Take a look at the game state. Under 2,000 gold difference, it reminds me a bit of game one where Gen G, you know, they got the Barons, and this time around it's a Red Bull Baron power play that went about equal in gold. You got the Baron gold itself, and kills were traded, turrets were traded, and we're kind of where we left off. In this series, we have caution against, oh, the super strong scaling late game team and these advantages, and yet it has really been determined by those heroic plays on the world stage when there's so much pressure on you here in semifinals now. Genji are definitely going to need another big one. I think especially when, when we're talking about the state of the game, right, looking at how some of the CS advantages have flipped from early on to where EDG have done such a good job of funneling this gold, you'll get Viper now especially up of almost 70 CS. Even in mid lane for Scout, up about 40 CS. Only in top lane is where they are really down. But we've seen many times Rascal cannot go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Vladre. Here we go. Baron in 130, Dragon Soul in about the same amount. EDG able to fight for their side of the map, uh, trying to funnel gold as best they can. Void Staff is pretty soon for BDD. Death Cap not too far away for Scout. QSS also in for Viper. So while Cleanse is down, he has another way out from the bubbles. Level 16, he's been fed heavily. About to reach 400 CS. He's going to Flame Horizon the opposing mid laner, which is not how it's normally used, but he's still 66 above Ruler. It has been about the Lucian. Viper has almost been EDG's primary engage. Yeah, he has earning, you know, health leads, uh, allowing them to set up on these objectives so quickly. A lot of big chunks from him. Despite that, though, Genji still with the overall gold lead and uh, a lot of punch packed behind any of these bubbles. Of course, they're looking to play off of uh, any sort of pick that they can get. The problem is that EDG have done so well playing the Econ game that they've actually stabilized and be able to retake control of their own jungle uh, and actually have the time now to set up. 50 seconds left on the arrival of the Soul Dragon for them. I, I think this also goes to show what can happen when you aren't, when the team with the advantage isn't stacking up Drakes too early. That EDG were allowed to just, you know, sit in their base, farm what camps they needed. They weren't really any under threat of like an early Elder Drake coming out that they would need to be pulled out of their base to fight for. Jinji getting in the position where they continuously had to try and pull them into the Baron pit. For the most part, it hasn't worked. It did work once. We're gonna see if they are able to find it again because Genji's composition really has no DPS. It's all about the burst coming out from the Zoe from the Misfortune. Again, the Rascal forcing the Shirelias down. Every other major cooldown though still available for use as EDG looks for the poke, not gonna find it. Baron has spawned. Dragon's up in five seconds. EDG completely on the bottom side of the map. As long as they don't get cross map, this is gonna be Dragon's soul. Oh, and Rascal. Yeah, okay, he's got a Guardian Angel, but that is life's ultimate down. That's 1,000 health left for the Renekton. And Flandre is hitting the Cloud Drake. Dragon Soul is going to be claimed. The surge of movement speed is going to be valuable. Life poke down to 1k. Scout run around with a lot of move speed. 
and uh oh, Rascal's got a flank play. Rascal's got a Zolti pop. Rascal's gonna go in for this one. Bullets oh, on the top, and then you lead two. Rascal's huge. Viper trying to kite away. He will stay alive. GA popped, but EDG have to run for their lives. Flandre the attack. Flandre the target, and Flandre to die. Gen G may lose the soul, but they win the fight. Yeah, when you don't have engage, you need to find those flanks. Rascal doing such a good job to set up the key damage from Ruler to take down Scout, who's been the key member for EDG in these fights. Again, the individual heroics from Gen G. Got the wave. That's the big thing. He dunked the deals AOE. He EQs out and he's running at Mach 3. Thank you, Cloud Soul. But here's the new wave. This one will mean a turret. And they got to buy 30 seconds. 20 for Scout, 10 for Mako, 30 for Flandre. Yeah, they got the wave, but there's another one right behind it. And Gen G are going to usher this one into the Nexus turrets. Viper ult on, gets away from the bubble. They got to fight for this wave. Gen G is going to do his very best to knock it up, but he should be dying for this one. Can they fight for the rest, though? Help was getting a little bit low. Tidal wave to clear out the wave as best it can. He's drowsy. He will be drowsy. Dropping the kick back. Viper barely lives. One turret down. Second one gone as well, but Scout is here. Is it going to be enough? Will they get the Nexus? Viper's in for two, but Ruler to knock down the Nexus. Gen G, two to one. And Gen G were not favored coming into today's series. Now sitting on match point, finding the early game leads, but it was all about that one pivotal flank coming out from Rascal to bring it back. This is. Truly shaking up to be the year of the LCK. Now with Gen G having the lead over EDG in this series. Series point coming up now for them. So many big plays. Yeah. Say what you want about Rascal on the Renekton. and he finds his brush. Another surprise brush play. Waiting there with the flank. They pincer them off, even with the setup there for the objective end. Another critical one for Gen G, right when they need it, Lyric. Yeah, it, it's it's so critical to see, right? Because we saw the fact that EDG were just outscaling them. It, it looked like it it was done and dusted. They were forcing them off the objective, but one play brings it back. BDD though, another highlight, right? He sure. You you need to stop giving this guy Zoe. He didn't pick in the first two games. This time though, he's an absolute terror once again. Definitely a big deal. Rascal on Comfort. Not many other people are playing Renekton, but he's doing it and he's making it work well done to him. Well done to Gen G. Now we are at match point in favor of Gen G. And after the break, Dash and the analyst will run us through this match. See you soon. A lion. Oh, yes, the king of the jungle. Time for a quick Red Bull? Red Bull? But you still won't be quicker than the lion. I don't have to be quicker than the lion. Just quicker than you. Red Bull gives you wings. The magical power of the realm is a mystery. Like a guardian, it is with you always. Defending you, charging you, watching over you like... Actually, it's not magic. It's this Cisco network. The power behind every gank, every combo, every mind-blowing moment at League of Legends World Championships. I woke up to the morning sky first Baby blue just like we rehearsed
Welcome back to the State Farm Analyst Desk, where it is all on the line now as Gen G are just one game away from facing Dom Juan Kia in the world's 2021 final. And uh, Chronicler, I was nice enough to give you uh, the rest of that last segment off and then the entire game here, game number three, to uh, collect yourself, your thoughts. And, uh, and then yeah. he got another Renekton pick, uh, but it didn't at the win. So how are you feeling? <laughs> how we doing? S scaling Renekton. I I'm not going to lie. When I saw the first half the draft and Zoe and Renekton were in bed, like, I knew it was going to happen. I, I knew <laughs> yeah. like, there, there was no doubt in my mind like I could see the future and you just know it is Gen G and honestly like I can't even really fold them for it because they keep winning and that is the enigma that is Gen G that is the core contradiction at the heart of Steam they are really good right? and I they, think you should stop giving them these champions just ban the Renekton does it make sense? No, but you need to do it. Right? See, this is actually, this is a bit of a conversation that we were getting yeah. into uh, in the green room backstage, Zale, where it's like, at what point do you just, you, you let go of this idea of what should be strong in the meta and start to recognize what your opponent is good at and look to disrupt it? Exactly. I mean, I think it's the concept of, of banning the player instead of banning the meta, right? It's the idea that they, if they're so good at these specific champions, even if they are not higher in your, your tier list or whatever you want to say, mm -hmm. well, maybe you need to take it away. And then, you know, I'm, I'm of the opinion that Lee Sin needs to be kind of going up higher on a lot of people's tier lists. People are very clearly happy yeah. to give it away. They're not really concerned about it. They're banning other things out. J4 is getting picked you know, even above it. Lucian's getting picked even above it in some of these games that we've seen across knockouts. And Leeson, like, I would love to know what Leeson's record is actually across all of knockouts. Yeah. Because it has just been dominating games. Look, I understand Canyon is Canyon. Uh, but it, after watching him play Lee Sin, I feel like that should have been enough to prove your point. <laughs> and then you get to today, and again, you've got Clid doing work on the Lee Sin and Chronicler. The first 15 minutes, you isolate that for Gen G, and again, time and time again, it looks good. And and this is what Gen G, even against um, teams that are stronger than them, generally excel. Right? It's those first 10 to 15 minutes, especially when they get this top side. It doesn't necessarily have to be the Lee. We've seen Khalid do this on other champions, uh, like the J4, like the Vogue Bear throughout the split as well. But the core thing, BDD on Syndra or Zoe, and then Rascal on his Renekton, right? And they know how to play this out, um, even against teams that are better than them. And these early kills are what allows Gen G their extremely mediocre mid game, right? Because they are so far ahead, they get such a consistent early game leads that they are able to kind of do nothing uh, for like 15 minutes afterwards. Yeah, and I mean, I, th I think it is honestly really impressive how they are able to consistently create these leads because I don't think a lot of people saw this happening, you know, against EDG, who is a pretty solid team, who obviously has an incredibly strong bot lane. We saw the footage of, of them actually dying 2v2. And then I just think that BDD on, on Playmakers, on Champions where he has some agency, is a completely different beast, right? He played well on the Seraphine, but when he's playing on the Zoe, when he's playing on, on and even the Azir, and he can actually create action for himself, he can capitalize on opponents' mistakes more easily without relying on team. I just think it's it's really really impressive and he rarely ever steps a foot wrong on the Zoe Yeah, it's a good call because it's it's not just Clid being Clid although he yep. is uh, definitely performing in today's series He's got people like BDD behind him on signature picks like the Zoe uh, But this is where I will at least return to the idea chronicler that Genji is not without fault And while they are picking up the wins We are still seeing those glimpses those pieces of what we have been critical of in this playstyle, Which is a, a mid game that really slows down and creates openings for their opponents. And, and this consistently happens, and this is actually where I think that the windows for EDG lie, is how good they are at consistent side lane pressure. Because Gen G, with this Renekton pick, I think they team fight better than arguably any team with the Renekton, which in of itself sounds contradictory, but they actually think I use, even in the late game, use the pick really well. But what they don't do well is side lane setups. We see consistently EDG, whenever Gen G tries to go for an aggressive play, um, to try and corral them away, right? Draw attention on the other side of the map. And this is what stalls out the game so much, because unlike teams like Domino T1 that will recognize the opportunity to strike when the iron is hot, Gen G always have a little bit of reluctancy uh, surrounding the every move they make. So instead what you see is they back off, they back, and then they just try to fish with that one bubble, right? And that goes into what I think Azil said earlier tonight, where it's like they are reliant on BDD popping yeah. off because outside of that, their setup, is just not good enough. And the fortunate thing, as we see time and time again, is that the plays individually are so good, but it's not 
the, the way that they go about it, I don't think is sustainable. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You well, you you would think that, right? But I mean, here they are. They're they're one game away from going to the finals. It's it's one of those situations it's though where it's like they dominate early, and then we've even seen them sometimes showing up late after they get the first two dragons, and they should have a free third dragon, <laughs> yep. and they're just not even at the dragon when it spawns and it's given away for free. But they do come up huge in these circumstances again. BD on the side finding chunks on multiple members here, completely zoning them out. He plays so well around the architecture of the map. You know, they are playing from red side, but he's coming down into the enemy blue buff area and was finding so many picks. Yeah, and so while they will pick up the Baron, we of course see the fight to some degree go the way of EDG. Yep. But with that Baron buff, they buy themselves the time. That establishes, I think, some of that wave pressure that they're looking for to continue to let BDD rein in those bubbles and look for it all. But as we know here at the World Championship, every second counts. And thanks to the reliable Cisco network, it's Rascal who finds the flank to take Gen G to match point here in this series. Yeah, I mean, I just think that this, this TP flank was beautiful. There's really no way out here for a scout. He knows that he's just caught, so he tries to drop the gravity field and flash over the wall, but Slice and Dice wasn't committed because all Rascal had to do was wait for the rest of his team to actually push him into that no-win position. He does it beautifully. They pick up multiple kills here. And once you saw these kills going down, you kind of knew that the game was going the way of Gen G. Yes, there were the respawns coming through. It was a close thing to actually finish on that push, but that's really all they needed there. And it was just great setup to actually find that team fighting like Chronicler is talking about. Even if people don't think of the Renekton as this kind of powerful late game pick, yeah. if you have the right angle, it can look really, really good. And in some ways, Chronicler, uh, Rascal was, you know, the remaining top laner in the tournament that was most criticized coming in, right? Uh, and, and so it's pretty cool to see him be the one to come up with the game winning play in that moment. And it speaks to a Gen G that now looks like they They've got momentum to close this one out. I, I, I think it's the, the criticism still is justified and it ties into like the larger Gen G paradox. I, 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 I love this team and individually they look like they should be able to do so much more than they're able to do. Um, but at the same time, right? Like, they but they're almost the in the world finals. <laughs> isn't, isn't that they, enough? No, isn't good, that a lot? Like, but that no, no. But, but yeah, I mean, it is. But that's the insane thing. Is like you feel like these players, especially in clutch moments, have been able so much more. And I think that the big difference between this Gen G and the Gen G that we've seen over the last two years is that. Up until now, BDD and Clid have looked invisible in high stakes best of fives. This time, it's not happening. The rest of the team is getting pulled along as well. And I think that with the momentum that they got right now, I don't know if EDG can bounce back. Uh, it's a question that only EDG can answer. Gen G are making it happen. They're making it work as they push the series score to two and one. For the hopes of the LPL, they rest squarely on EDG soldiers needing to put two back to back to push themselves to a world final. We'll see if they can even get us to silver scrapes here as we head to game four right after this.